for joining our session. I'm Eileen Brucato, a graduating MLA student at Cornell, and I will be your MC. If you have questions for today's speaker, please use the Zoom Q&A feature and we'll take questions at the end if there's time. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, Penn State Landscape Architecture, for sponsoring our talk today. Penn State Landscape Architecture is recognized for student-centric educational excellence and innovative research. Faculty represent a full range of interests from scientific to artistic and humanistic views of the world. Thank you. Also, if you are a licensed professional and would like to receive one CEU credit for this course, please visit www.labash.org slash L-A-C-E-S. Now, I'm so excited to introduce our speaker. Kartika Rahmawadi is an associate at Brightview Design Group and founder of Idea RC Studio with 15 years of experience on a diverse range of projects, including regional planning, urban revitalization, transit-oriented development, resort, and park design. A creative and versatile designer, she is passionate about projects expressing sensitivity to the environment and community. Her team won the Rio Reimagined competition held by AIA Phoenix Metro AZ and ULI AZ in 2018 and presented the Regenerative Ecological Urbanism Education Session at the ASLA National Conference in 2019. She is a licensed landscape architect and received a Master's of Urban Design degree from the University of California at Berkeley and a Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Indonesia. Today, she's presenting her talk on regenerative ecological urbanism on compacted grounds, resilient approach to climate change mitigation in the American Southwest Desert region. Welcome Kartika and thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to present the proposal, um, the Regenerative Ecological Urbanism uh, presentation uh, at this labus. And um, yeah, I will go ahead and present um, my uh, study here, but um, I would like to start with um, introducing Brightview. So I am a urban designer and landscape architects at a Brightview Design Group in Denver office. So Brightview um, is the nation's uh, landscape service companies. We have about 20,000 team members with 2.4 billion revenue and uh, excellent landscape services, um, for servicing the entire spectrum of landscape life cycle with integrated service from design, pre-construction, development, and landscape services that include maintenance and enhancements. And as you can see here, uh, Brightview reach uh, across the United States. We have several offices for design group, as well as uh, development and maintenance. And uh, each project that we touch transform the everyday one-of-a-kind environments that profoundly affect people's life. That includes resort and hospitality, higher education and corporate campus, retail center, parks and streetscapes, as well as master plan community. So yeah, that's a brief introduction about Brightview Company. And now I'm going to start my presentation. So this presentation about regional ecological urbanism focusing on uh, climate change mitigation in American Southwest desert region is, uh, is gonna be, um, you know, like uh, encompassed in four different uh, different um, chapter. The first one is about the climate change and then uh, American Southwest region. And then I'm gonna be focusing in Arizona. And then last but not least is the uh, case study, which is the uh, Rio Salado Rio Reimagined with our uh, project as the winner of the Rio Reimagined competition. So, um, Let's go ahead and talk about the climate change here. Um, just let me. Can you guys see my screen? Uh, okay, okay. So, so in this climate change topic, I would like to speak about the IPCC, uh, the disasters induced by climate change, financial market collapse, 
RCP scenarios, Paris Agreement, and nature-based solutions. So this one, um, the IPCC. IPCC is the Environmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the United States, a United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change. And according to the IPCC, the planet's dangerously warm future is already here. So as you can see on the graphs on the left side, so Earth has already warmed more than 1.5 degrees Celsius since the industrial revolutions. And in fact, we have recorded seven consecutive warmer years since 2014. And the distribution of regional warming can be seen in the maps on the right side, ranging from 0.75 degrees to three degrees Celsius with the Arctic Circle or North Pole being the highest increase in temperature at the rate more than twice of average global warming. So what does it mean? So as you can see in this images here, we have been um, experiencing a very extreme natural disaster induced by climate change. And unfortunately, like these two happens in the United States and showing, um, you know, like the two spectrum of the extremes. One is the hurricanes, and this one is in Houston, as you've shown in the image. There's like uh, excessive uh, flood and, uh, you know, like uh, a lot of rains in the hurricanes. And in fact, uh, we have run, you know, the naming of the hurricanes of an alphabetical order and uh, like over five um, a magnitude scale. And on the other side, on Calif in California, uh, and American Southwest, uh, we're experiencing a prolonged drought and creating this wildfire. And this image is from California wildfire just recently happened last year. So obviously uh, the things that impacted is the finance sector. So not only the environment, but this bring a lot of uh, damage to the finance sector as, as well where as you can see is uh, in this graphs, the trend is keep growing up and the magnitude of the loss is in billion dollars. And in 2020 it, uh, record, we have 22 climate disaster totaling over $95 billion loss. And NOAA has been tracking this over uh, several years since 1980 and we have um, count like $1.9 trillion in loss due to the climate change. So the next slides, um, this is the different scenario, what we call as the uh, RCP. So if you look into, you know, uh, in current um, years and go all the way to 2100, and predicting the, the temperature raise from uh, one degree Celsius to 3.7 or close to four degrees Celsius, what the impact will be. And for us to be able to go through this different path, what we need to do. So for instance, <clears throat> if we just go by, you know, like uh, business as usual, so we might as well gonna go with the RCP 8.5. What it means is um, the temperature is going to rise by four degrees Celsius, and that means the extreme weather is going to happen on uh, more frequent basis, and we're going to have the high cost impact of this. So, um, to understand better what's the difference, even just within the half uh, degree Celsius. There is this uh, extreme weather is going to happen more frequently in the Arctic sea ice, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, meaning there's no ice on the Arctic uh, North Pole every 100 years. And if we increase it just by half degree Celsius, that can happen only within every 10 years. And of course, there's another, you know, like a lot of different impacts as well as far as water availability, people displaced by climate disasters, 
uh, species uh, or biodiversity, food system, cor coral bleaching, and so on. So um, another thing that I would like also to present here is, is the importance of the Paris Accord Agreement. So what is the Paris Accord Agreements in a glance? So it is an agreement to limit greenhouse uh, gas emission mitigation, adaptation, and finance and signed in 2016 by 187 countries. So the Paris Agreement has long-term temperature goal is to keep the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. And the ideal persuasion is to limit the increase up to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which will substantially reduce the risk and impacts of climate change. Um, so there is a website that you can track uh, the climate change actions. Uh, it calls climateactionstracker.org. And uh, unfortunately, the current standing as of November 2020, the two largest emitters, which is China and United States, are both critically insufficient, as you can see on the map of the world in this left side, so in, in that gray color, which means if we keep doing this thing, so the world is going to be on track to four degrees Celsius warming, which is the, you know, like the highest, um, um, or what do you call it, like the worst uh, extreme scenario possible uh, within the RCP 8.5. So, well, unfortunately, this is the, like uh, hopefully something good is going to happen uh, when President Joe Biden took office. Um, he signed an executive order right away within the 30 days um, of the process for the U.S. to enter re-enter the global pact. So rejoining the Paris Agreements is a significant step uh, by the administration to reverse the climate policies of the last four years, during which the previous ad administration rolled back and loosened many of the country's bedrock environmental policies and regulations. So um, Biden's plans to host the climate summit of world leaders on April day, uh, April 22nd, excuse me, on Earth Day, to roll out the US goal for reduction of carbon emission by 2030. So this is gonna be more stringent measures with the goals as follows. First is to reduce national greenhouse gas emission by at least 60% from 20, uh, 2005 levels by 2030. And the goal to decarbonize power sector by 2035, 100 zero emission light duty passenger vehicles, mostly you know, like the electric uh, cars, um, and then reduce the carbon footprint of the building sector by 50% uh, in 2035. And uh, the mitigation of climate change will be based on nature-based solutions. And this is a fundamental part of action for climate and biodiversity across all different types of biomes, wetlands, forests, coral reefs, dunes, uh, urban green space, rivers, floodplains, and mangroves. And according to United Nations Global Impact Research, natural-based solutions uh, can provide over one-third of the cost-effective climate mitigation needed between now and 2030 to stabilize warming to below 2% and achieving natural mitigation of 10 to 12 gigatons of CO2 per year. Um, so the next uh, chapter, I'd like to focus on American Southwest. So the, uh, speaking about the American Southwest arid regions, we have to understand the global atmospheric cells that um, you know, dictate all these different type of uh, climate across the globe. So there are th three cells that make up the global atmospheric cells, as you can see in this uh, image here. So we have Hadley uh, closer to the tropical zone, feral and the polar. So what is Hadley cells? So Hadley cells is the global scale tropical atmospheric circulation that features air rising near the equator area. And this 
circulation creates a trade winds, uh, tropical rain belts and hurricanes, subtropical desert, desert and jet stream. And as you can see in this diagram, this is where the American Southwest uh, arid regions located. And uh, you know, the, the formation of this arid region here is affected by the Hadley cells along the uh, tropical equator in, in the Atlantic oceans. Um, so what is, does it mean by expansion of the Hadley cells? For this region of American Southwest, the expansion of, expansion of the Hadley cells means desertification. So expansions of Hadley cells will create the heat waves worldwide, worldwide, which is longer, hotter, and more common, according to the IPCC. So deserts are expanding toward the poles, moving toward the higher latitude with dust storm while zones of colder weather are shrinking. The American Southwest geogra geographical rich, uh, regions um, encompass the seven states of Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, Colorado, Nevada, uh, North Texas and Utah. The geography of the arid region is dominated by the desert at the south and west reaches of the area to include the Mojave, Sonoran, Chihuahuan Desert and the Colorado Plateau and portion of the Great, uh, Great Basin Desert. So, um, the most important thing now, uh, we're looking into the climate change impact in the uh, South West uh, American is the Colorado River basins. So the two major rivers of the American Southwest region are the Colorado River running in the Northern and Western areas. And the other ones, the Rio Grande running in the East, North to South. The Colorado River is an over allocated source it spans over 1,450 mile long and drains an expansive arid watershed that encompasses parts of seven US states and two Mexican states. So the region's water supply relies on Colorado River, which basin consisting of upper basin and lower basins with the headwaters on the west side of Continental Divide in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. And as you can see in this slide, um, there are several dams uh, built in across the Colorado River is to gauge the, the reservoir, um, the level of water in, along the Colorado River. So, um, in its natural state, with over 40 million population depend on the Colorado River, uh, the river poured about 16.3 million acre feet into the Gulf of California each year. However, uh, flows at the mouth of the river have steadily declined since the beginning of 20th century. And in most years after 1960, the Colorado River has run dry before reaching the Pacific Oceans. And this is the overview of Colorado River allocations. Um, it is an over, over allocated resource. The irrigation, industrial and municipal diversions, evaporation from reservoirs, natural runoff and climate change have all contributed to the substantial reduction in flow threatening the water supply for the future generations. Colorado River Basin continues to experience uh, its worst um, 20 years drought on record dating back to, 2000, to the year of 2000 as one of the driest in the 1,200 year paleo record. And uh, as you can see here, the water shortage or we may call it a water crisis uh, can be seen in these two images of water level elevation from the year 2000 to the year 2016 of Lake Mead uh, Hoover Dam in Nevada. So the assumption of having 60 million acre food storage can no longer be achieved. 
And this is the graph uh, from US Department of Interior Bureau of Reclamation, showing the reading of water elevation of the two reservoirs at the Lake Mead and Lake Powell combines in 2018. And they both uh, combine at 50% of their storage capacity. Because of uh, growing demand of populations and urban growth, relentless shortage and climate change that increase the prolonged drought. These are creating an average of water deficit of almost 1 million acre feet every year in the Colorado River system. So both Lake Powell and Lake Mead reservoirs are half empty and scientists predict that they will never fill again. So those prompt us to the importance of um, a regenerative ecological urbanism as a resilient approach of mitigation of climate change impact and an augmented strategy to increase the bearing capacity of the arid region. So this strategy is implemented by restoring the environmental ecosystem, reconnecting community to the green infrastructures and productive landscape cultivation with economic benefits. Building sustainable architecture subservient to the larger ecological system. Adjustment of development form to arid climate. Application of transformative agriculture practices in arid regions and renewable energy as ab abundant resource using solar, heat and geothermal energy. So now we're going to dive uh, deep into Arizona, which is uh, one of the uh, critical areas impacted by the climate change. So this graph shows the RCP 8.5 scenario represents uh, projected future temperatures, assuming greenhouse gas emission continue to rise with average daily temperatures at 95 degree and above. And this map shows uh, the RCP 8.5 emission scenario where you can see it's in the dark red color. Phoenix or Maricopa County in Arizona will be under extreme heat and unhabitable. So these extreme temperatures will become a commonplace in the American Southwest region experiencing above 95 degrees Fahrenheit for six months of the year. Now let's focus on the major urban areas in Arizona. So central Arizona is a vast metropolitan area spread across one contiguous sprawling oasis, essentially equivalent to the Phoenix metropolitan area. The city of Phoenix is the largest urban center and located in the approximate center of the area that includes Tempe, Mesa, and many others. The entire urban areas of Arizona have major dependence of Colorado River as water supply, which is unsustainable. Um, Gia River, as you can see in these diagrams, um, so this is the Colorado River, and then we have the Gia River as one of the largest tributary of the Colorado River in Arizona. Um, formerly one of the Colorado largest tributaries is contributes, nowadays contributes little more than a trickle in most years due to its use of water by cities and the farms in central Arizona. And to protect uh, Arizona water supply and water right of our Colorado River, the local government uh, built the Central Arizona projects. As you can see in this uh, sign color, it is a 336 mile aqueduct system that taps into Colorado River and brings Colorado River water to Central and Southern Arizona, delivers the state's single largest renewable water supply and serve 80% of the state's populations. And as you can see here, this aqueduct, uh, yes, go across more than 300 miles and serving three major users, which is the municipal and industrial, um, agricultural, and for the Native American tribes. 
So now, in response to the water crisis, so before tapping into the underground water resource and even relying on the Central Arizona project, even though it's renewable, but it's still heavily dependent on Colorado River, Arizona should make an effort to reduce dependency to Colorado River by augmenting the bearing capacity of Guia River and Rio Salado. Now, let's take a look uh, at the largest user of water in desert region. And as you can see here, the conventional agriculture is the largest water user in Arizona desert region. And this, uh, you know, this photo is, this is in Arizona desert, and, uh, green lush vegetables grown in the desert, which is uh, counterproductive in my point of view. And uh, the conventional agriculture in Arizona contributes as one of the biggest state revenue. So Arizona farming consists of 26 million acres generating about $23.3 billion in state revenue. However, they use five, over 510,000 acres of irrigated area and shedding a hefty tag of more than 2.5 million acre feet of water per year, which means 70% of Arizona water is diverted to agriculture. So what we should be pursuing to tackle this water crisis in Arizona is to adopt transformational agriculture to conserve water in arid regions. So this is the pictures of um, a startup company called Aerofarm that just recently go public uh, last month and valued over uh, $1.2 billion with indoor vertical farming technology as an example of transformational agricultural practice. And it's this diagram showing their technology um, the entire uh, system used less than 1% of the land required by conventional growing to achieve the same harvest volume. And it has over 390 times more land efficient than uh, conventional farming system based on vertical nature of growing and up to 30 uh, harvest per year, 30 times harvest per year. And it, it requires no sun, no soil, with 40% less water than hydroponic farming. And uh, there is also another example, which is Plenty, is uh, basically adopting a similar technique. And another one is called as um, square roots, uh, using the uh, a container for growing uh, medium. And uh, with this container, it's more scalable to be place in urban areas. So uh, yeah, that brings us to the last chapter, which is the real reimagine um, initiative. And uh, I would like also to present a real eco venture as the winning um, entry from the competitions. So the real reimagine initiative, the real salado or South River is a 200 mile long river formed by the confluence of white and black rivers of flows westward as the largest tributary to Guia River in Arizona. So it is a perennial river in the upland areas and uh, it flows over three zones of West Valley, Central Valley and East Valleys and goes across the Phoenix Metro, um, passing through multiple dams and man-made lakes along its westward course until the granite reef diversion dam where the dam diverts all the remaining water in the Rio Salado into Arizona Canal and Southern Canal, which delivers uh, drinking and irrigation water to much of the Phoenix metropolitan areas. Uh, unfortunately, below the granite reef diversion dam, Rio Salado is totally a dry bed only having water from the upstream storm runoff and rain. Um, this is the uh, Rio Reimagine initiative uh, 
website. So uh, the Rio reimagined project's geographic span is 58 miles stretch of the Rio Salado from Granite Reef Dam to State Route 85 to include Rio Salado and Guia River. The Rio reimagined belongs to eight communities along river corridor and the partners in creating vibrant urban river fund for the valley. So um, the Rio reimagined, you can uh, look at their website, rioreimagined.org. So this is a uh, uh, thanks to the early advocacy and leadership uh, from US, uh, late US Senator John McCain uh, and Arizona State University as an active and diverse community partnership to leverage uh, support for the redevelopment and restoration of their urban riverfront. Um, so the Rio Reimagined uh, competition was launched in 2018 by AIA Phoenix Metro ULI Arizona and Arizona Ford are seeking the best ideas to address three major goals, which is the resilience uh, to include climate, water, energy, and economic, um, the regions across the east, central, and west zones, and to uh, gain the revelation that benefit community, education, recreation, commerce, and preservation. Um, on, uh, during the competition, we were given options of site contacts to select from, uh, from the east, central, and west zones. So we chose the central zone for urban condensation opportunities and presents challenges as a dense population living in the area and giving us opportunities to implement regenerative ecological urbanism approach as a means of mitigation uh, to the environmental degradation urban heat islands and water shortages. So um, these slides, uh, this is showing our uh, entries as the winner of the competitions. Uh, the titles Rio Eco to Venture, Visioning an Expon Exponential Loop Economy of Ecological, ec sorry, Ecologic, Ecological, <laughs> I have to repeat again. So the title of the competition uh, is Rio Eco to Ventures, Visioning an Exponential Loop Economy of Ecologically Regenerative Island Urbanism, which I will uh, explain a little bit more in the next few slides. Um, the runner-ups, uh, they are ACOM and uh, Dick Studio. So the team consists of several engineers from Dallas office and a Phoenix office, and they're looking at uh, the regional approach to Rio Salado. Uh, they call it as braiding the Rio. And the second runner up is Studio MLA, Mia Leher Associates, who designed um, this, the consultant of uh, River LA uh, restoration projects. And they're also looking at the regional approach of uh, restor restoration for Rio Salado and they call it as retracing the water's age. Um, and for uh, this competition, we were invited in 2019 to do presentations um, in front of the AIA uh, constituent in Phoenix, along with the runner-up teams. And uh, we also um, then um, brought this up for uh, ASL National Conference in San Diego in 2019 and conducted this um, education session on regenerative ecological urbanism and um, we partnering with um, Ambient Energy which is the expert of the regenerative ecological urbanism uh, principal consultants. Um, yeah, so I am from Brightview and then my colleague uh, Michael Krause from Krause Architecture in Phoenix and Clayton uh, Bartsak from Ambient Energy, we all of us uh, present uh, during this education um, session in San Diego. So uh, yeah, um, the starting like uh, ideas of uh, the Rio Eco Venture winner competition entry is uh, this agricultural base um, from Holcomb civilizations in Arizona. So uh, focusing on uh, Phoenix, Arizona urban areas as an example of uh, compacted grounds of its layered landscape ecology. So this Valley of the Sun has a long history of agriculture 
dating back to pre-Columbian era. It was originated as far back as 300 BC where Hohokam tribe built extensive and ingenious canal network as the most advanced agricultural practice of their era, irrigating thousands of acres of farmland. The agriculture practice were accustomed to desert climate, relying on the intermittent streams of Guia River, Rio Salado, San Pedro, and San Cruz River. So Rio Salado uh, has been undergoing hydromorphological alterations since Hohokam civilizations. It is a 200 mile long river formed by the confluence of white and black rivers flows westward as the largest tributary of Gia River. Um, and as you can see uh, in this photos, um, there is a starking difference between the upland area and the urban areas. So um, up until the granite reefs uh, sub diversion dam where uh, the dam diverts all remaining waters of Salt River into the Arizona Canal and Southern Canal for delivering drinking water to the metropolitan area. Rio Salado is a dry bed, only having water from the upstream storm runoff and rain. It flows past the cities of Mesa, uh, Tempe, Scottsdale, and south of downtown Phoenix as Barren River, except when heavy rains upstreams forced Stewart Mountain Dam to release more water that can be diverted at Granite Dam. So our project seeks to reintroduce the progressive agricultural practice as a venture and the backbone of the local economy. Um, this is our um, you know, uh, initial sketch on how to do the restoration and ecological intervention along the five mile corridor of the Rio Salado. And we dive deeper into Rio Salado corridor of central zones as the extension of Tempe Town Lake to the west in our proposal. And we looked into a regenerative ecological urbanism approach as a means of mitigation to the environmental degradations urban heat island, water shortage in Phoenix metro areas. So the Rio Salado ecological intervention and restoration efforts will connect Audubon and reason to become complete green infrastructure and environmental engines. And we envision to live with the river, breathing in resonance with the river's natural life cycle and not building dams and we strive for sustainable bioengineering best practices as opposed to established heart engineering practices. So this is the area of photos uh, showing that five mile stretch within the central zone. Um, the Eco2 uh, campus, uh, the location that we chose is the 19th Avenue landfill. Uh, we propose uh, ecological intervention and restoration efforts linking the other bond uh, close to the downtown Phoenix to the recent campus, which is the Resource Innovation and Solutions Network to become a complete green infrastructure and environmental engine. We will achieve the Rio environmental restoration and regenerative development goals through four layers of ecological interventions. So the first is constructed ephemeral wetlands. So with this constructed ephemeral wetlands as ecological interventions, uh, we aim to support the hydrological ecosystem to mitigate desert flash floods and to create mosaic of native desert riparian habitat. As you can see here, we look into this different uh, like native habitat that we would like to um, recreate within this ephemeral wetlands. The second layer is the phytoremediation, implementation of phyto phytotechnology for landfill remediation using native desert uh, phreatrophic species, which is the species that has a very deep uh, root system to clean the groundwater and the contaminated soil of the industrial areas and uh, CO2, uh, atmospheric CO2 absorption from the atmosphere. 
And uh, the third layer is the afforestation intervention to create a multifunctional urban forest using the desert native tree species along the Rio Salado corridor to mitigate the urban heat island, improve the microclimate and CO2 absorptions. And then the last uh, layers of the ecological interventions is the sustainable urban farming, which is the conversion of the underutilized land into productive and ecologically regenerative landscape through sustainable urban farming practices to include hydroponic and aquaponic technologies to benefit communities and local economic to thrive. So for the campus site locations, we selected a 19th Avenue landfill as we felt it's strategically located within the five mile segment of Rio Salado central zone stretching from Audubon to the recent um, and city of Phoenix. So the thought of an agriculturally centric community between those two bookends will connect and tie the central corridor together. And this site is identified as a super fund uh, site by the uh, EPA. It's 213 acre has tremendous potential for campus site based for regenerative development and sustainable food production. And um, you can uh, look further um, the benefit of development of super site, a super fund site um, in EPA website and how the development can benefit the local economy. And um, we can also look into several case studies. And um, these are the initial uh, concept studies of the campus uh, showcasing ecological interventions um, and also how we're going to create this compact uh, campus within the walking distance um, and uh, the idea of the architecture as the subservient of the uh, regional um, ecological system. And um, this slide shows the Eco2 campus plant um, consists of self-sustaining buildings and landscape that are designed to encourage creative pursuits of innovations of research and scientific ad uh, advancements of agricultural products and processes in sustainable food technology and offering high quality of living and integrated landscape system that weave into the fabric of the regional plant for your salad dough. So this uh, mixed use, low rise, uh, high density development is planned as compact development pattern within 330 foot of walkable grid size and um, will be fueled by um, without fossil fuel vehicles at street levels and de dedicated fully for pedestrians. It has this uh, green spine uh, connecting the river to, to the campus. And the development seeks to build attractive and inclusive pedestrian environments sheltered from the climate extremes with surrounding land supported by harvesting uh, wind, solar, algae, and urban research farming. And the campus landscape site uh, programming includes constructed ephemeral wetlands, uh, palo for the phytoremediation and ecological reserve, multi-mechanism desert forest with park and trail network. And this is showing the transect uh, diagrams of, of the campus uh, with a closed loop net positive system capturing the solar energy uh, generation, uh, reclaimed gray water and captured storm water uh, runoff, purified through on-site biological and mechanical treatments for hydroponics and vertical farming and aquaponics. Does this create a closed loop system uh, to, to generate the, to support the um, indoor agricultural farming uh, practices? And we also come up with this development programs and resiliency metrics. The campus uh, development will be implemented as mixed use district in three phases of construction. 
with the grow house uh, incu incubator uh, at its center, a built upon resiliency metrics encompassing environment, economic, and community goals. Um, the buildings, so this is the, the ideation of the grow house buildings. The geometry is inspired by the notion of bringing people back to the land to raise awareness and advocacy of natural resources with the form emerging from the earth and building upon this concept of an agricultural center development um, that showcased the building that could also serve as a community resource and education center for the regions. And this is the, uh, the concept of the uh, grow house as a resource center as the heart, um, at the heart of Rio Eco2 Venture Campus. And the placemaking building will strengthen the development and surrounding communities, providing link to the future ideas around the Rio Salado. Um, and the uh, potential interior, interior uses can be um, used to generate revenue, such as interactive educational programs, uh, seed library, highly efficient uh, vertical hydroponic and aqua aquaponic farming for the community. So yes, this is the uh, end of the presentation um, of our winning entries. Um, and I would like to also um, recommend this further reading for uh, the topic um, as far as the climate change and um, the American Southwest. And I have the books here. Um, this is uh, just recently launched. Um, at the same time, US rejoins the Paris Climate Agreement by Bill Gates, How to Avoid Climate Disaster. Um, and the other three books is about the focusing on American Southwest, Colorado River, and Phoenix as the least sustainable city in the world. So I highly recommend this further reading. Yes, thank you so much uh, for attending my presentation today. Thank you so much, Kartika. That was an incredible talk. I have so many things that I'm thinking about now that you brought up and <laughs> many questions that I personally would like to ask you. Um, if folks have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A feature uh, and not the chat. Additionally, if you see a question that you're really interested in hearing the answer to, you can upvote it by clicking the little thumbs up button under the question itself, and that will bump it higher in the queue. It looks like we have a question already. This is from Nicole, and it asks, do you think the techniques used by Aero Farms will become more popular slash become the future of farming? Uh, yes, I do believe so, because there is an urgency. Um, it's not only about the agricultural practice itself, but relating to, you know, how much more we can rely on, uh, especially in this American Southwest region, the Colorado River, and um, the, the most, you know, like the important fact of that is the largest a consumer of the water is the agriculture base, so like the uh, conventional agriculture base. And not only it's related to the water um, consumptions, but it's also related to the land use. So the climate change, um, in order for us to be able to tackle the crisis, is to look into the land use as well. So we need to increase, let's say, the forest um, afforestation. It needs a lot of land. And um, to be able to do that, the conversion of land-based agriculture needs to be done. Um, and that's going to help uh, for us to increase the biodiversity because uh, you know, like the agricultural land comes with the expense of losing the biodiversity on the planet. So there is that issue of biodiversity to, to tackle the climate change as well as the water shortage. So the vertical farming system can be one of the solutions uh, to tackle uh, that crisis. There is a, a caveat still, you know, like what type of um, 
vegetables can we grow into the vertical farming system? And mostly at this point is the green leaves, uh, you know, lettuce and uh, in all that families, but the vegetables uh, that has, you know, like the roots still has to be grown on the soil. So it's almost like how to uh, create a balance on how much we can grow in the vertical, in the farming system, as well as land-based um, agriculture system. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, we have a second question, it says amazing presentation. I agree. Um, and then they go on to ask, will this project be built and will it be federal state project or a joint business slash government sponsored project? So uh, thank you, uh, that's a really good question. Um, our hope would be this, this vision will be realized as hopefully sooner than later in the future. Um, this is, it's, it's an ideas competition. So the AIA, uh, Phoenix Metro, ULI and Arizona for they, they were seeking for best ideas of to tackle all, all, all of the issues all together. And um, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's a long-term goal as well. So um, our best effort at this point um, as a, you know, like the design consultants and has this uh, vision and uh, we care about the environment and the community. We always want to bring uh, this, you know, like the, the voice to be heard and bring it to more uh, bigger and wider platforms. So our hope would be, of course, like this can be realized uh, someday in the future. Um, and um, I mean, for me personally, uh, I will keep, you know, like uh, spreading the words and getting into this kind of event, uh, speaking on the uh, SLA, uh, Labas, and, you know, all, all the other platforms and to, um, as, as the best effort for now, um, to create awareness uh, beyond our prof professions. And hopefully, you know, Again, is this, this will be built um, sooner than later. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, would you mind if I ask you one of my questions? Would that be all right? Yes. Um, this is sort of a, um, a more speculative question, but when I was thinking about the Colorado River Basin, I was just curious if you could envision sort of a pivot in the landscape architecture discipline where we end up designing on a much much larger regional scale. Um, for example, thinking about designing for the Colorado River Basin in its entirety, that's obviously a system that crosses through many different states and, and mm -hmm. jurisdictions. And I was just curious if, if you saw any potential for sort of a, a collaborative network of landscape architecture firms in these different states that are sort of working together to create potentially a kind of comprehensive design for the entirety of, of the, the basin. Um, that was just something I was thinking about during your, your talk, and I was curious what your thoughts were. Yes, uh, definitely it's a possibility. And I think uh, it's almost like um, we, we have that obligation as landscape architects uh, and as a, a stewards of, of the environment, um, you know, like beyond uh, doing our usual daily practice. This is a much larger issue that we deal with. Um, there, there is a lot of, uh, there's going to be a lot of um, challenge, especially uh, it, it also political issues at this point. Um, and uh, it goes across different, um, um, how to say like government and local government entities, different states. So the challenge would be how to bring people together um, beyond um, our own personal or local interests and uh, this is to serve you know a larger uh, community and larger regions and we all in this together so i mean with that kind of um say like motivations and uh you know dealing with the the impact of the extreme of climate change um impact then we all have to come together to to do this effort. Absolutely. Um, we have time for uh, one last question. This is from Benjamin. 
Uh, and they ask, uh, is there a way to design for water retention in communities which struggle with drought? Can we as landscape architects provide any measure of relief? Uh, so uh, the first thing that we have to understand is uh, the pattern of the water, how it behaves in the arid regions. And uh, to be able to, you know, as a landscape architects using our tools and knowledge uh, to implement in this kind of region, it has to be very specific. So for instance, uh, you know, the palette uh, that we propose, it has to be uh, custom to, to the climate regions, native um, desert type of plants. And uh, those type of plants as like within like 100 years of adaptations, uh, custom to the climate so they can only, they, they can thrive, uh, you know, like with whatever given uh, the water uh, precipitation is in the air regions and they have a very deep root level to reach, you know, the, the ground uh, water level. So um, what I'm saying is uh, the, the means uh, as, as a landscape architect for doing the landscape uh, ecological interventions has to be um, contextual the, where we use you know, the type of plants that is the native for the desert region. So yeah, I hope that, that answer the questions. Yes, that was great, thank you. Um, and I think we actually do have time for a very quick uh, answer to this last question uh, by Emily. And this is, um, you mentioned that the Colorado River is a highly over allocated river. How do we go about fairly allocating and defining water rights along the entire length of the river from areas upstream versus downstream and urban areas versus rural areas? Um, yeah, again, um, every jurisdiction uh, has their own responsibility for, uh, you know, like, uh, this, this allocation of the river, so it can be fairly divided into all these different uh, urban areas and states. And uh, as I presented earlier, if every single jurisdiction, uh, you know, it's becoming more and more uh, enthusiastic and in applying this regenerative ecological development principles on all levels uh, as an augment, augmentation of the bearing capacity that um, in the long term and you know like as an concerted efforts can help in um, tackling the issues of over allocations of the Colorado River. So well, wonderful. Thank you so much. This was an incredible talk. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much to all of our attendees as well. And um, I'll end here in order to make room for the next uh, session. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a lovely day. Please enjoy the rest of the conference and take care. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Okay, bye.